read a very familiar passage regarding that that actually tells us a little bit more than that, but uh, at least tells us this much, that he is the truth, and obviously being the truth, he will communicate the truth. So we read in John 14, verses 1 through 6, in the upper room discourse, Jesus comforting his disciples, preparing them for his betrayal, his crucifixion, the difficulties they would go through before the day of Pentecost, when he would empower them and give them grace to be able to face those things. He says this, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Again, we want to focus on Jesus being the truth, who speaks the truth, and, uh, and, and the things that we've already seen. Now, uh, just to recap, again, we've seen that it is God's will to make us like his son. That's why he sent Jesus into the world, uh, to make us like him so that in the end he can give Jesus, you know, the brethren who are just like him. And this is why Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit so that he might work this grace in us. And so I thought as we come to the end of this short series that, that we could review what we've seen so far just by asking ourselves some uh, personal questions about whether we see these things actually happening in our own lives. Okay. So here are the questions. Do, do we love the Father more than anyone else, more than anything else? Jesus loved his Father. He lived for his glory. Is that what we're doing? Do our hearts draw us towards him? And do they draw us out to do his will? In other words, um, do, we, do we need the, the fire put to our heels, as it were, to get us to, to go in the right direction? Or do we find ourselves going that way because that's what we desire? That's what the love of God is supposed to be doing. Do we love him in the way that he tells us to love him in the commandments? Again, having him as God, worshiping him in a way that's pleasing to him, keeping our vows, our promises, our oaths, keeping his day holy. That's, that's the big one that I think a lot of, you know, just don't, a lot of Christians, professing Christians just don't seem to understand. It's not the Sabbath hour. It's the Sabbath day. Do we love our neighbor as we love ourselves? Are we loving our neighbors as Jesus loved his neighbor again as he calls us in the commandments? Are we being a good Samaritan you know, to those around us, particularly to our enemies? Are we moved by the needs of those around us? Do we show mercy to those who have injured us? And again, that's loving our enemies. Uh, not taking their injuries to heart, remember, as we saw in 1 Corinthians 13, but rather for forgiving them. Are we working hard for God's glory, for His kingdom? Are we patient and kind and humble? Do we hate what's wrong and love what's right? Do we believe the best of others? Do we hope for the best in others? Are we willing to bear hardship for God's honor? I, th I think you understand Jesus, of course, did all of these things. And if we can honestly say yes to these questions, even if only in a small way, then Christ is being formed in us. I think I told you the, you know, the Puritans, uh, they wrote many books on assurance. How can I know I'm a Christian? How can I know I'm a true believer? And then they go to paint a picture of perfection of, of Christ and what that's like and by the time you get to the end of the book, you're saying, well, I know I'm not a Christian after reading this. But then Thomas Brooks in, in his uh, book, Heaven on Earth, uh, says this last thing that sort of pulls you out of the fire when he says, if, if any of these things are true of you in even the smallest way, then you are a true believer. It's not that we're content with it being just small, but he's saying there are certain things 
that can only be in our lives if we have the Spirit of God working in us in a saving way. And if He's working in us and we can see that, even if it's in a small way, then we can know that we belong to Him. So we, we know that we're not perfect. We shouldn't expect to be perfect. As a matter of fact, those who say they're perfect actually don't know the Lord at all. That's what John tells us. Even Paul wasn't perfect, and I think he's the best example we have of someone uh, outside of Christ who um, lived the, the best possible life that could be lived. But as he tells us in his own testimony in Philippians 3, he pressed on, he desired to excel still more, and so must we in all these areas. But now also in the area we're going to look at this evening with, with which we're going to conclude this brief study. We're going to look at three more characteristics that we see in our Lord. I've already told you what they are, that He spoke the truth, that He was willing to suffer for the truth, and that in His suffering He had joy, which is what made it all worth it. Now first, Jesus always spoke the truth. Now when He says in our passage, for instance, that He is the way, Okay, he was speaking the truth. He is the only way to God, the only way to be reconciled with the Father. There is no other way, there is no other religion that God will accept, no other Savior, no other path. And this is perhaps the one claim that Jesus makes that offends more than anything else that he has to say. And perhaps, um, actually, as we uh, look at that or um, go through that series I was telling you about by R.C. Sproul. Uh, we'll find that that is the thing that rankles a lot of people today. They don't want to believe that there's only one way, but that is the truth. No one can come to the Father except through Jesus. Okay, that sort of primes us for what else we're going to look at. Now, when he said that he is the truth, he was speaking the truth. Okay, he is the personification of truth itself. Not only did Jesus never tell a lie, he also never spoke half-truths. He always said exactly how things are, even when he knew it would be offensive, okay? He spoke the truth. And of course, when he said he is the life, he was speaking the truth. He's the only one who can give eternal life, really to know him is eternal life. Uh, his obedience, his death is the only way to know him and to know God. Now, John tells us that Jesus is the eternal logos, you know, which is basically a word that means word, okay? He is not only God himself, the one through whom he made the world, but he is the word of God, the revelation of God, the wisdom of God. He is the communication of God, the one, of course, who reveals God. He came into this dark world, which darkness is a symbol of ignorance, in order to shine his light, light being a symbol of truth, God's truth, so that we might know who God is and what He is like. John writes in um, chapter 1, verse 14 of his gospel, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And just a little bit later, John writes this, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, He has explained Him. So He reveals Him in the way that He lives and the things that He said. Jesus said that to see Him was to see the Father. And of course, since the Father could not lie, neither can our Lord Jesus. Now, the point is, uh, Jesus is the truth. Jesus speaks the truth. He came to reveal the truth of God. And if Jesus is being formed in us by His Holy Spirit, the same thing will be true of us. Remember last week we saw in 1 Corinthians 13, in verse 6 in particular, that love, uh, the love that the Spirit gives, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. This love makes us want to live by this truth. After reminding the Ephesian believers what their life was like before they came to Jesus, tragedy, travesty, 
Paul writes in Ephesians 4, verses 20 through 24, but you did not learn Christ in this way. Notice you did not learn Christ. This isn't what Jesus is like, but I'll tell you what he's like because this is what you are to be like. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Uh, Paul says that before you didn't live according to the truth because you didn't love the truth, but now that you're in Christ, you love that truth and you have been recreated in his image. So you will now love the truth and live by the truth. But to live by that truth, Paul goes on to say, we also need to speak the truth. Paul continues in verse 25, therefore laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Now Paul's saying here, first of all, that as Christians, we, we need to speak the truth to one another. Now, he doesn't mean by this to use the truth to, you know, in, in any way towards one another. Sometimes we can use it to hurt each other. Sometimes we might reveal things that were told us in confidence, in which case we can speak the truth to the injury of one another. We can be too blunt. We can be too frank. We can be too pointed with our facts and not really express any concern, but more wanting to sort of chasten them for whatever it is that, um, uh, that they've done wrong. Uh, we're not to use it to injure. We are to use it rather to build up one another. Paul again writes to the Ephesians in chapter 4, verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Notice it comes from speaking truth and speaking it in love towards one another, I think by way of encouragement, encouraging one another to become more like Him. Now, that doesn't mean that the things that we say may not sometimes have the potential to hurt other people. Sometimes we do have to say things that are potentially offensive. I mean, think about what Paul wrote to Timothy when he said that Timothy must reprove rebuke and exhort, and we don't often think of those as things that people like to hear. To reprove means to point out something that somebody's doing that's wrong. To rebuke means to call them to repentance. And to exhort means to encourage them to do what's right. But if you encourage somebody to do what's right, that means they're doing things that are wrong. You know, there's times when we're going to need to do that as well, uh, speak the truth. But we are to do it, as Paul told Timothy, with great patience and instruction. Remember our Lord Jesus Christ uh, rebuked His disciples on, on occasion. He rebuked Peter when He said, The Son of Man must go to Jerusalem, be betrayed and handed over and crucified. And Peter says, That'll never happen to you, Lord. And then Jesus said to him, Get behind me, Satan. He rebuked him. Uh, but he didn't do it maliciously. He didn't do it judiciously, but he did it rather in love and compassion, and that's what we need to do. Now, that can be a hard thing to do, uh, particularly those last three things, because most professing Christians, I think, and, and we, we know this from our own experience, really don't like to admit that they ever do anything wrong, but it's still the right thing to do. It's one of the ways the Lord keeps us going in the right direction. Think about what David says in Psalm 141, verse 5. Let the righteous smite me in kindness and reprove me. It is oil upon the head. Do not let my head refuse it. David saw it as a good thing because it, it helped him to see his faults and to get his ways straight before the Lord. Now, we're also called to speak truth to unbelievers, and we know that's not necessarily going to be easy either because we need to share with them the only truth that can save them. That's what the Great Commission is all about. 
That's what Jesus did, obviously. That's what he's commissioned his, his disciples to do. That's what he calls us to do uh, the same. And so that brings us to the second point, because I think we usually think of suffering for speaking the truth more in the context of evangelism than we do in ministering in-house. <laughs> Although, I think we'd have to admit, we can suffer in both spheres. <laughs> but the second point is that Jesus was willing to speak the truth, even though it meant he would suffer for it. Let me draw your attention to the verses we read in, in our opening meditation. Jesus said to the Jews in John 8, verses 39 through 40, If you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. You know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because as I read this, it makes me wonder whether Jesus had in mind here, are you Abraham's physical offspring? Then why aren't you behaving like Abraham? That doesn't really make any sense. Do, do our children behave like us? Should we expect the children of Abraham to believe like Abraham? But if they are ch the children of Abraham by faith, well, then we would expect them to behave like Abraham. And I think that's what Jesus had in mind here. But Jesus told them the truth. And the fact that they wouldn't receive it, but they wanted to kill him instead, showed that they are not the true children of Abraham. They do not believe in him. But the point is, Jesus spoke the truth, even knowing they would respond this way, even knowing that they would want to kill him. Now, this isn't always the case. It's been pointed out that Jesus' ministry essentially had three phases. During the first year of his ministry, when the Jews were just becoming aware of who he was, he was something of a novelty. They were very interested in him. In his second year, when they began to become convinced that this one might be the Messiah, he was very popular. And there were thousands who followed him. But when it became clear that he wasn't the Messiah that they were expecting, you know, not the political leader that was going to lead them against Rome, the third year was his year of opposition. Most of the Jews turned against him to the point where they wanted to kill him. Again, especially the Jews in uh, Judea. But regardless of the time, the time in his ministry, regardless of where Jesus was, whether what he said would be accepted or not, Jesus spoke the truth, and he was willing to suffer for it. Now, we know that we always run a risk when we speak the truth, and that would be true even if we could speak it as perfectly as Jesus did, as compassionately as Jesus did. I mean, he did it perfectly, and the Jews still hated him. But even though we can't do it like Jesus, that's what he calls us to do, to speak the truth. As Paul told Timothy, in season, out of season, when it's acceptable, when it's not acceptable, we need to speak the truth to our brothers and sisters in Christ if, if they need to be spoken to, but also, of course, to unbelievers. And that means that we must accept the possibility of suffering and of persecution. I think we, we know that most unbelievers will reject what we have to say. You know, John tells us as much in his first letter in, in sort of almost cryptic, not really cryptic language, but in a way that's put together, it may not be as clear. But in 1 John 3, verses 11 through 13, he first of all says this, that Cain killed his brother. And then he asks the question, and for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Well, what is his point? He then adds this, do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you, okay? Why would the world hate you? Well, they're going to hate us for the same reason Cain hated Abel, because his deeds were righteous and Cain's were evil. The world isn't going to hate us because what we tell them is, is so unbelievable, so ridiculous, uh, even though that's likely what they're going to say. Okay? Uh, but they're going to hate us because what we say exposes their guilt. You know, I've seen um, uh, evangelism videos where um, somebody fairly well-known goes out to a high school and he asks, he'll ask a student, first of all, do you, think, um, do you think you're okay? Do you think God will accept you the way you are? And, and they begin by saying yes. And then he goes 
through the commandments with them. And at the end, do you, do you still think you're okay? Do you still think God's going to accept you? And they kind of smile and say no. Well, they know in their mind that they're not acceptable, but they still don't know in their heart. It hasn't struck fear in their hearts. The, the, the evil has not been exposed. It needs to come home, but that's something only the Spirit of God can do. But the way that it comes about is by exposing it with the light. We need to remember that unless they see that light, they're not going to be saved. Remember what we saw this morning? Peter and John were willing to tell the truth, even though they knew the religious leaders that were in control of the temple would hate them for, um, for, for telling the truth and teaching the truth. Remember, they were arrested and they will be put on trial. But yet, thousands were saved. And the only reason they were saved was because they were willing to shine the light even though they knew the potential for suffering was there. We need to be willing to suffer in speaking the truth, again, if we are going to do the Lord's will. But then my final point is, is this, that even though Jesus was hated almost universally for speaking the truth, he personally had no regrets. Paul had no regrets. Peter and John had no regrets. As a matter of fact, we're going to see after they're put on trial and released, they go back rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why did Jesus have joy? Well, he first of all had joy because he knew what he was doing was pleasing to his Father. Uh, we read in Psalm 40, verse 8, what David wrote regarding Jesus' attitude towards doing all he did for the Father's glory. He says, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Jesus didn't regret obeying his Father, pleasing his Father, suffering for his Father. He delighted in it, even when it meant suffering. Jesus told his disciples on one occasion that doing what the Father called him to do gave him more pleasure and was more sustaining to him than eating the food he needed to sustain his body. Remember when, he, when they returned from the Samaritan village with food, Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. That is so satisfying. That is what I delight in. You know, think about how much we enjoy eating good food. Jesus would set that aside and do his Father's will because that was more satisfying. That's, by the way, something else that uh, the Lord is working in us, but it's that that sustained him. The joy of knowing that he was pleasing to his Father, but it was more than just that, we know. It was also the result of the Spirit of God working within his soul. Jesus came into the world as a man, experienced everything we experience as human beings, and it was the Spirit of God who gave him that joy because Paul tells us in Galatians 5, verses 22 through 23, that joy is the fruit of having the Spirit dwelling within us. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, which means that, that, you, that Jesus can have joy even in the worst of, of circumstances for more than one reason. So even though he suffered for the truth, Jesus found joy. Now, when we learn by God's grace to speak the truth without fear, we will find the same joy. Joy in doing what Jesus calls us to do. Joy in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Joy in knowing that when we obey Him and we suffer for it, it gives us the assurance that we actually belong to Him. Think about what Jesus said uh, to His disciples in Luke 6, verses 22 through 23. He says, Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. Basically, you're in good company when you do what is right and suffer for it. That shows that you belong to the Lord and you have a glorious future. So rejoice for your reward is great in heaven. And so in conclusion in this series, I just want to say this, that as, as those who are um, predestined to become like the Lord Jesus Christ, 
we need to set our eyes on Jesus and follow his example because that's the example given to us, the example the Spirit of God draws our attention to. It is the goal. He is the paradigm. He's, he's the, ex uh, well, he's the model. And that is what basically is the goal of the Spirit's work. So we need to set our eyes on Jesus. We need to seek to follow that example, again, by the grace of the Holy Spirit. And as we've seen this evening, in following that example, let's speak the truth and not be afraid of the consequences. And we will know uh, the joy of the Lord. We will experience that in, in our lives. Well, let's, um, let's, have, let's just bow for a moment of prayer.